Amen. All right, so on Sunday evenings, as we preach through our doctrinal statement, we're, we're going to pause where we were moving on the end times and tribulation. We've had a lot of questions on Calvinism recently, so we're going to touch on that a little bit. We have one point left in our church statement that we've not preached on yet, and it's soul winning and evangelism. Let me read it to you. We believe that it is the duty of every Christian to go out and preach the gospel to the lost. Steadfast Baptist Church is a soul winning church. We believe in practice door to door soul winning. We believe that God wants all people to be saved. Therefore, we do not believe in Calvinism or irresistible grace. We believe that an unsaved person cannot be saved unless they hear God's word and are given a choice to believe on Jesus Christ or reject the free gift of eternal life. Amen. Salvation is a choice made by the individual. So this is what we're going to be preaching on tonight. Now I preached a sermon earlier this year called John Calvin the Reprobate. And I went through and detailed his life and a lot of the things he was associated with and the problems with the man John Calvin in the origin of his doctrine. You can always watch that online. There's a link to it on our website. But I'm going to touch on some different points tonight. We just read Matthew 28. Look at verse number 18. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. So here the Bible is clearly teaching us that we need to go out and preach the Gospel so that others can be saved. This is a commandment of God. Now turn to John chapter 6. The title of my sermon tonight is Calvinism versus Evangelism. Calvinism versus Evangelism. Because the two concepts are diametrically opposed. Yeah, that's right. Now, in Mark 16, the parallel, it says, And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Now, every creature isn't talking about dogs. We don't preach Amen. to dogs. It's talking about all mankind, right? right. We teach to everyone. Everyone needs to hear it. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Yeah. Notice it doesn't say, you know, because Calvinism would teach whosoever God doesn't like would be damned, right? But that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible teaches. So we're going we're gonna to look at a few different points here. And a lot of people, they usually have these, these straw man arguments. Oh, you must be in Arminianism. No. Calvinism and Arminianism are both wrong. Yeah, that's right. if, if you even know what Arminianism is, most people don't even know that much about Calvinism. They are both doctrines of men that are based on the Catholic Church ultimately. They didn't come from the Bible. They didn't come from born-again believers. They didn't come from Christianity. They came from Catholicism. And we don't, we don't support either one. Now, Calvinism ex itself originated from Augustine, which was a Catholic pervert. This guy literally castrated himself. And we are not Reformed, and we are not Protestant. Yeah, right. If you ever hear somebody use this buzzword, sovereignty or doctrines of grace or reformed or protestant just beware okay yeah. because they probably believe a different gospel yeah. and they probably don't preach the gospel which is a good thing at least calvinists don't go soul winning because they don't believe that's what they're called to do they believe god's just going to pick and turn you on and the whole nine yards and it's not up to them so that's why you know we're going to talk about evangelism versus calvinism now I want you to hear this. The heretic John MacArthur states, I am a Christian today because before the foundation of the world from all eternity past, God chose to set His love on John MacArthur and to give him the faith to believe at the moment that God wanted him to believe. So he doesn't know what a biblical Christian is. Right. He's literally saying, I couldn't believe. God forced the faith on me. God put it in me. I didn't. I couldn't even chose from myself. And that is not biblical Christianity. Uh, you know, in the Bible, what is a biblical Christian? The word Christian in Acts 11, it says, And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. 
And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So here in Acts 11, it's introduced. It was preached. Men turned and believed. They heard it. They said, yeah, that makes sense. I believe that. And you go down on the passage. And when he had found them, they brought them to Antioch, Antioch. And when it came to pass that a whole year after they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So according to the Bible, a Christian is someone who has chosen to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for That's salvation. Right. That's right. It, you had to hear it preached. You had to choose to believe on it. Yeah. And this concept, as, as I mean, I'm preaching to the home crowd here, you guys know this. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of verses that teach salvation is by faith alone. Right. And the Calvinists will say, well, I agree with that. The problem is it's not your faith. Yeah. The problem is it's not your choice. The Calvinists would say, I had no choice in the matter. One day I woke up and found out God had picked me to become a Calvinist. You know, and they would, of course, they would say, pick me to be elect, pick me yeah. to be a Christian. Right. But what they're saying is a Calvinist. Because a Calvinist would not believe in a Baptist faith alone crowd like us, they would not believe that we're saved. Yeah. They would say that by trying to have faith, we're trying to work our way to heaven. They would pervert the gospel and preach another gospel. So when you have somebody that's a five point Calvinist, they believe in all the points of what's called tulip, which we're going to look at. You have a problem with that person. Yeah. Okay? And I do believe there are, there are many people that are on the fence. They'll say, well, I'm, I'm not a five point. There may be a one or a two. Or this verse kind of makes sense. I'm not really sure about that. And that's just kind of what I want to clear up. Brother Dustin was asking me questions about Calvinism. After the service this morning, I thought, okay, all right, Lord, I hear you. I was thinking about, you know, okay, we, I know we need to talk about this because it's come up several times with our soul winners out recently. So this is an important topic, and I want to give you some verses to help persuade you, because honestly, when it comes down to it, it's either we believe in the tradition of men, or we believe in the Word of God. Right. And it all starts by faith. And I, hey, I have faith that what God said in His Word is true, and if there's a verse that seems confusing to me, I have to take it on faith that God is right, and the majority of what He says is right, and maybe I'm misunderstanding something. So the, the things that are mysterious to us sometimes, First, God wants to see a willing heart that we're willing to say, maybe I'm wrong. Right. Maybe what it sounds like, you know what I mean? So, so if you'll start from that standpoint and just say, I want to know what God says, and I believe in God, and I want to be a Christian, maybe, maybe you're not because you're focused on Calvinism. Maybe you are, and you still have confusion about certain verses. And I want to try to clear up as much of that as I can. Now, if you would, turn to uh, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is, a, is one that is often taken out of context. In verse 44, it says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Well, there you go. That clearly teaches you can't choose to believe, right? I mean, case closed. But that's not really true, is it? Is it saying there's no choice in your salvation? Is that what this verse is really saying? Because in John 12, he says, And if I be lifted up, this is Jesus speaking, I will draw all men unto me. Yeah. Right. Jesus is saying, I will, I will draw all men. Hey, he died for everyone, yeah. for all men, that all would be saved. It says it all throughout the Bible. So John 6.44 is sort of taken out of context. And this is one of my biggest points here, is that context kills Calvinism. Yeah. Context kills Calvinism. Let's back up a little bit and look at John 6, verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me and believe not. So immediately in context, Jesus is telling us there are those that will come, there are those that will believe, there are those that will not believe. Right. All that the Father given me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up again at the last day. Now this is an eternal security verse. Yeah. He's not going to lose it. Oops, God had me, dropped me, fell out of His hand. Oh, I'm not saved anymore. God lost me. No, He's not going to lose you. God created all things. He's able to hold on to your soul. But look, in the next verse is, is very important. And this is the will of Him that sent me, 
that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Right? Look at these choices. What is the Father's will? That we would believe on the Son. You cannot take it out of context. You can't superimpose your own thoughts on this. You can't say, well, God willed me to be saved. Hey, God's will was that I would choose to be saved. Right. That I would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Look at the response Jesus gets after He says this. He says, Then the Jews then murmured at Him because He had said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that He saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not amongst yourselves. No man can come to Me except the Father which hath sent Me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now one of the first things to notice here is those opposed to what he's saying are saying, we know your father. Your, your father's Joseph. Right? The Jews did not believe in Jesus. Right. Right. Oh, well we know Joseph. Joseph was not his father. His father was in heaven. Immediately he corrects them on this. And in verse 45 he says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Then he's telling them, you don't know the Father. You don't even know the Father. He's telling the Jews, you do not know God. If you had learned of God, you would know of Me. And He says the same thing in other places. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on Me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 1. So in this verse... You go a few verses before, a few verses back, right? Yeah. So verse 44, they're going to say, see, you can't become saved unless God picked you to be saved, which means He picked everybody else to go to hell. That's literally saying God is a respecter of persons. God picks favorites and says, nope, I don't like you. You're going to hell. That's a wicked doctrine. Yeah. That's a strange God to have, one that would just arbitrarily pick and choose who goes to hell. Yeah. God's already determined, and it's up to us whether we will believe. In John, John 6, like I said, three verses before or back, you're clearly seeing it's all by our choices to believe on Him, to be saved. So as a church, we believe that God wants all people to be saved. Therefore, we do not believe in Calvinism or irresistible grace. We believe that an unsaved person cannot be saved unless they hear God's Word and are given a choice to believe on Jesus Christ or reject the free gift of eternal life. It's up to them. God's not going to twist their arm. And just as much as it was your choice to be saved, now that you are saved, it's your choice to obey Him. right? It's your choice to be chastised by Him or it's your choice to be blessed by Him. It's all about choices. It always has been. And even the angels have these same choices. There were those that choose to rebel against God. There are those that still choose to stand before God today and honor Him and worship Him and proclaim His holiness. So every, every, everything God's created, He's given a choice. You know, John Calvin writes... For the evangelist says that no one can believe except he who is born of God. Therefore, faith, listen to this, faith is a heavenly gift. Moreover, faith is not cold and bare knowledge, for no one can believe unless he is born again by the Spirit of God. Now, the Bible teaches that we're born again after we've believed. John Calvin teaches first you're born again, then you're able to believe. Jesus said in John 3, He said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So the question, well, how do I get born again, right? He says that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, where this concept is introduced, is very clear. To be born again, you have to choose to believe. That's not what John Calvin taught. He's literally saying, God flips the switch, and you become a Christian. You don't even know it yet, but you're a Christian. Right. What strange doctrine. You know what I mean? Yeah. R.C. Sproul, another famous Calvinist, he says, a cardinal point of Reformed theology is the maxim regeneration precedes faith. He says, our nature is so corrupt, the power of sin so great, that unless God does a supernatural work in our souls, we will never choose Christ. To say that we're regenerated before we have faith 
That's literally implying that we have forgiveness of sins before we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Talk about putting the cart before the horse. Talk about causing utter confusion. <laughs> Regeneration precedes faith? My friends, that is heresy. It really is. James White, he's in the same camp. He says, Do we believe to become born again? Or must we first be born again before we can exercise true saving faith? So he's saying the same thing. God had to born, make me born again. Now being born again is referring to a spiritual birth. Listen to this. John, the heretic John MacArthur says, A notable scholar who is very helpful in many of his writings, Norman Geisler, wrote a book called Chosen But Free. And he presents the reality of irresistible grace or this saving calling, that effectual calling, as according to him, listen to this, making God into a dictator with power that crushes our freedom by dragging us into his kingdom. This is who John MacArthur cites as a spiritual authority. This, and he quotes him saying that, you know, God's a dictator and he drags you into the kingdom, he crushes your freedom. You, you are not free to choose. Which is, you know, he's fighting against the concept of free will when he's saying this, when he's supporting it. And again, that goes against everything the Bible teaches. God crushed our freedom and forced us to become a Calvinist. We're, we are born again not knowing God, and then he gives us the gift to believe. Think about what he's saying. We're born again, I don't even know who God is, and then he gives me the ability to believe. It's backwards. It's yeah. totally backwards. And really, it's, it's a doctrine that's full of pride. Right. You know, well, I'm one of these special ones. God picked me. Right. Man, <laughs> yeah, look, you're in Ephesians 1. Let's take a look at this. We're going to look at some of the passages they use. Verse number 4, it says, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. Now again, what's His will? That we would believe on Him. The word that throws Him off is predestination. What the Calvinist would teach is, it is already predetermined that you would be a saved, that you would be a Christian. Why? Because God made you regenerated, and then He gave you the faith, and then you just wake up one day and you're saved. But they missed the boat. His will is that we would believe on Him. Our destination, ultimately, is heaven. Look, in verse 6 he says, "...to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace." Again, this is something that John, Calvin, or that John MacArthur does not believe. He does not believe in the redemption through the blood. He mocks it. He says that there is no sacrifice of blood in heaven. When Jesus said that He must go to heaven, he, he, doesn't blot, he doesn't believe all that. He just says blood is figurative to that Jesus must die a violent death. Right. He missed the boat. Yeah. Jesus' blood was sinless and perfect. Blood must be shed for the remission of sins. Yeah. Either my blood will be shed, I will die and go to hell, or I'll accept the payment of Jesus Christ and His perfect blood being applied. Look at verse 11. It says, "...in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ." So again, context kills Calvinism. It says that you trusted in Christ to become predestinated. "...in whom, also, tr in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Born again is the spiritual birth. When it says sealed, that Holy Spirit of promise, the God's Spirit coming into you, that is the being born again. So when they say you're regenerated, you're born again before you have faith, they miss the whole boat because in John 3 he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, ye must be born again. 
So according to Ephesians here, how do we become born again by the Holy Spirit? It says we trust the gospel of our salvation. After we've believed, it says, we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So to take these verses out of context, oh, well, God only drew me. No, God drew all men. Oh, well, God gave me the faith to believe. No, you had to choose the faith. Yeah. And now that you believe, He gives you His Holy Spirit to be able to discern between the truth and a lie. Yeah. And it, Now, I want you to flip to Ephesians chapter 2. Looking at this same issue of, is the faith a gift? Because Ephesians 2.8 is a big verse that Calvinists like to twist. We use it out in our soul winning presentation. It's very clear. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I can't brag that I'm working my way to heaven. But look, he says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And a Calvinist would say that it is a gift is the faith. They're saying faith is the gift of God. You can't be saved because God gave you the faith. If God doesn't give you the faith, then God chose you to go to hell. But that is not what this is teaching. Again, context kills Calvinism. Okay? Look, flip ahead to Ephesians 3. I want you to see that grace is the gift. It said it in chapter 1. I believe it's saying it right here in chapter 2. Chapter 3 says the same thing. Look at verse 7. It says, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Amen, that's good. Now, what's the gift? Grace. It's grace. That's right. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. Flip ahead one chapter. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So is it the faith that's the gift or the grace that's the gift? The grace is the gift. Now turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Could I get a couple men to help me pass something out real quick? And then take some of these also. Um, I have smaller ones if you want. I have a full page. Now. These are some verses I use to help educate you about what Tulip is. So make sure all the adults get a big one, especially the old fogies like Brother Graham back here. It's kind of hard to see him. You notice I kept a big one, right? <laughs> I also have some little ones, so if you want a little one, something you can kind of keep inside your Bible, take whatever you need. If you don't get one, let me know. I will print more. I'll bring more. Now, the concept behind this, that what I'm handing out, is Calvinism debunked. Because I want to help you understand that, that John Calvin did not originate with this doctrine. It came from the Catholics. The Catholics are not saved. They don't have the Holy Spirit of God. That's why we go out preaching and get Catholics saved when we can. So here, this is where they have TULIP. Total depravity. Unconditional election. Limited atonement. Irresistible grace. And the perseverance of the saints. This is where they have TULIP. I asked my wife if she would go to the store and get me a tulip. We didn't have time. I wanted to have a tulip up here so I could crush it when we're done. But, but that's all right. I got a visual for you anyway. Now look, the way that I have this lined out is I have a summary of what is taught and then I have a bunch of verses below it debunking each doctrine. So in total depravity, it says, Adam sinned, therefore you are wicked and cannot choose to believe in God. This Catholic doctrine of original sin. Right? They taught, Augustine taught that children were, were despicable or, or detestable is the word he used. They're detestable. Children are just detestable. And it's like, this is the guy that castrated himself, right? It's like, okay, buddy. But what, he's, what they're saying is that at the moment a child is born, they're found a sinner and they're on their way to hell. They don't believe in, you know, that children die and go to heaven, as the Bible clearly teaches in several places. What they're saying is, because of Adam's sin, we are all found guilty. It's not what the Bible teaches. Because Adam's sin, death has entered the world, right? Death through sin. And now because of my free will, I've chosen to sin for myself. Yeah. I will go to heaven or hell based on my choices. If I had not chosen to believe in the Gospel, I would go to hell because of my own sin, not because of the first man, Adam. Right. And this is the, the, the original sin. And you know, we all have sin in us, but what they're doing is they're taking a biblical doctrine and they're changing it. And what they're doing is they want you to baptize your babies. You know, many of you know about 
in Acts chapter 8 how for a political measure, because the Catholics for taxation purposes and population control, that they wanted, they wanted to control. And they said, in verse 36 it says, And as they went on their way, there came certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now Acts 8.37, the next verse, is deleted from all the Catholic Bibles for a reason. They don't want this truth out there. They want you to baptize your baby and have trust in the Catholic Church. Yeah. Right. The verse says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So to be baptized, the one requirement is you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your baby able to do that? No. no. Therefore, it's innocent before God. Now, is that baby going to be rebellious and maybe sin? Yeah, sure, there's sin in the flesh. But God protects that innocent until they have the ability to make a choice for themselves. So you'll see there's some verses here to then give you power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on His name is the first verse, John 1.12. Now moving on, uh, unconditional election. He says, you are unable to become a son of God. He decides your fate, heaven or hell. The unconditional, there's nothing you have to do to go to heaven. God's going to pick for you. And that's totally wrong. We have a lot of verses here that totally debunk that. Yeah. Limited atonement. Jesus did not die for the sins of the whole world, only for Calvinists. That's what they believe. Because they would say that, according to a Calvinist, he would say, I'm unsaved because I don't believe in Calvinism. Yeah. Although they would give it lip service and say, well, it's by faith alone, but God picked me and you don't believe God picked you, so God didn't pick you. You know, we're not we're not playing, you know, picking teams for football here. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's kind of a strange mentality. But they literally believe that Jesus only died for the sins that would choose to become or that would believe in Calvinism, that would be a Calvinist. And that goes against so many verses. Yeah. Christ died for the ungodly, the free gift came upon all men, the great the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, the savior of all men. He's not willing that any should perish. You can see there's a lot of verses here. To debunk that doctrine. Now, irresistible grace is the primary focus of tonight, where he says, God forces repentance and regeneration upon you, and you cannot resist. Now, John Calvin actually taught, and I use these words very, very specifically here, because John Calvin taught repent of your sins, but he says that God would force it on you. Yeah. Right? With that faith that God forces on you, it will be evident by your willingness to turn from sin. Because you will become regenerate, otherwise you didn't endure to the end. And what they're doing is taking those verses about enduring to the end to be saved in Matthew 10 and Mark 24 where it's talking about the flesh enduring through tribulation and persecution. And they're taking that and applying it to the soul. They're making it a soul salvation verse and that's not right. Is grace irresistible? How many people today preached the gospel, and was rejected. Just by a show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven people today had the gospel presented to them, had the scriptures presented that Jesus died for their sins, and they chose to reject it. Can you resist grace? Yeah. Can you resist a free gift? Yes. I got a free gift. Who wants it? Eh, not me. Okay. I can't force it on you. I can't put it in your pocket. I can't put it in your house, you know. Look at Acts 7.51. He says, You do always resist the Holy Ghost. John 3.18 He that believeth not is condemned already, the Bible says. John 3.36 He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. 2 Corinthians 1.10 In whom we trust. Romans 5.2 We have access by faith into this grace. So the only way to get the grace, obviously, is by faith. 1 Timothy 4.10 We trust in the living God. Acts 10.43 Whosoever believeth in Him shall receive remission of sins. A lot of Calvinists would teach that your sins have already been remitted. Almost like saying, you're a millionaire, you just don't know it yet. Just The money's not in your account yet, but it's really there. God already put it in your account. You just have to recognize you're a Calvinist. And then all of a sudden, it's already happened. But it's really, it's really a confusing thing that they're doing because even though Jesus has died for the sins of the whole world, and even though that payment has been applied and it's being offered to you as a free gift, if you reject it, your sins have not been paid for. Right. Yes, He died for them. No, you rejected the payment. Right. 
right. and that's where that's where Calvinism makes the gospel into another gospel, it makes it confusing. Look, Hebrews four sixteen. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy. When you hear the gospel preached, the Bible says we should come boldly. Yeah, I want that gift. Yes, I want to be saved. Yes, I want my sins to be forgiven. That's what happens in here. That's the choice you have to make. And they mock knowledge as if you can't just have a mental assent. You just can't say, well, I know that he died. That's not good enough. And sure, it's with your heart. Man believeth unto righteousness. You have to make that choice in here. You can't just say, I know the, the answer and never really believe it in here. You can't. If you're not trusting it, it doesn't do you any good. So irresistible grace. The last point on here is perseverance of the saints. This is one that you actually may run into out soul winning. I've met Baptists that I truly believe are saved that are confused on this doctrine where they think that it means once saved, always saved, but it does not. It's a totally different doctrine. God gives you faith and election from birth. You will regenerate. Again, the litmus test for them is a clean life. Right? When you have certain Calvinists that would say there is no such thing as a carnal Christian, what's he saying there? There's no such thing as a worldly Calvinist is what he's saying. Because if you're a real Calvinist, you will regenerate. This is what Calvinism teaches. The evidence of your faith is through your works. Perseverance of the saints is not once saved, always saved, or eternal security. Perseverance teaches salvation is dependent on God causing you to turn from sin. Once saved, always saved teaches you choose to trust in Jesus Christ and receive the free gift of salvation. Hey, and then you should turn from sin, right? Hey, as a Christian, you ought to do those things which God has commanded you. But if you're trusting in that, if you're saying, look, I've turned from my sin, it must be true, I'm elect. It must be true, God picked me, then you don't understand the gospel. You're looking for that to just to make a show to men. There's a lot of verses that back that up right there. Um, one I like is uh, Psalm 89 where it talks about if, you're, if my children forsake my law, break my covenants, God will, not, God will not break His covenant. He's made a promise. He will not alter the thing gone out of His lips. Right. Alright, so you guys, you turn to... Where are you at? 2 Corinthians? Romans 8. You're in Romans 8, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. So here, how does God foreknow you? Well, for starters, He knew you before you were formed in the womb. He knew that you would be born. He knew what name your parents would choose for you. He knew the choices you would make in life, including whether or not you would obey the Gospel, including whether or not you would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ or not. So Him knowing that, He gives you opportunities in ministry. Because He saw that Paul would believe the truth, He put Paul in the ministry. Because He saw that I would believe, He wants my destination to be the same in the sense of being conformed to the image of His Son. And that's twofold. One is we're going to suffer in the world, but we'll also be glorified with the Father. Look, he says in verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. The Bible says we will be like him in glory. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now turn to 2 Corinthians 5. In 1 John 3, he says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. 1 Corinthians 15 teaches the same thing in that, one day we will have a glorified body. One day we will have the likeness, a celestial body like Jesus Himself. And we are destined to be like that. We have been predestined to that. That is our ultimate destination. And God knows that, which is why He wants us 
to live and follow Him today while we're saved, while we're on the earth, while we have time to serve the Lord. Because there comes a day when it's too late. It's too late to serve anymore. So we reject Calvinism and instead we teach evangelism. It's a very important choice. All of us have, have had the Gospel preached to us in one way or another. And we've all chosen to believe. We're commanded to obey the Gospel by believing. And we're commanded to preach the Gospel door to door to our family every day and persuade people to believe. Again, it's our duty as Christians to do this. And others have a choice, but we have to give them the opportunity to hear it. Right? How should they hear without a preacher? They have to have that choice. And you never know who you're preaching to. You think about it. Pastor Donnie Romero was sitting on his couch playing a video game, unsaved, Catholic, and somebody knocked on his door. You never know what door you're knocking on. It might be somebody one day that will be a great pastor. Somebody that will be a great soul winner and leading and sending other people to go out and go soul winning. Yeah. So take it very seriously when you go out soul winning. When we go out evangelizing, to have a, have a good attitude about it like, I don't know about this guy. He seems like a bum. He's got chips on his chest. Hey, one day he'll be a pastor. Right? <laughs> you never know, right? I mean, the, pa the guy that preached to Pastor Romero had to tell him, put the remote down, turn the TV off, sit down and listen. You know what I mean? But he preached with authority as Jesus did. Yeah. We've been sent out in authority. Right? He has all authority in heaven and earth. He's given that to us. And he tells us to go. Yeah. We believe in evangelism. There in 2 Corinthians 5, this is the last place. Verse 1, it says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tabernacle, were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. So what's that image of the Son? The adoption? How is it we're supposed to look like Jesus? This is the ultimate point. Those verses are not teaching that just one day we'll be picked to be saved. It's teaching once you're saved, God will have you in His image. Look at verse 6. It says, Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Right? We still walk by faith. It started with faith, and our life should end with faith. It's a journey of faith. Right? This morning we preached about strengthening your faith. Look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that He hath done, whether it be good or bad. Hey, there's your end times verse, right? One day, everyone in this room will stand before a judgment seat. If you're saved, you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And He says, what things did you do for Me while you were in this body? Look at the next verse. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest unto your consciences. Because of the terror of God, because hell is real, we persuade men. So you think about it. Calvinism versus evangelism. Calvinism would say, don't worry about it. Don't tell them. God will pick them if He wants them. Right. It's not true. It's not. It's wicked. The truth is, we have to go out and preach the Gospel. We are called to persuade men to be confrontational in it, and to try to convince them that God is real, Jesus is God, He died for every sin they'll ever commit, and that salvation is a free gift that lasts forever. And people that believe it will be saved. This is our purpose as a believer, and knowing that we're going to stand before the judgment seat of God, He's, he's telling us, knowing this, knowing that you'll receive a reward for the things done in your body, go persuade men. Yeah. Salvation is a choice made by the individual right. let's pray father god thank you for your word Lord, thank you for the free gift of salvation Lord, we thank you for this church and the, all the soul winners you've sent us lord Lord, we ask you would continue to send more families that want to be on fire for you that want to change their life that want to be soul winners and go out and save the lost lord we know you finished the work all we have to do 